Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sahana Pai, and I head HR for NU Hospitals. On behalf of NU Hospitals, I take immense pleasure in welcoming you all for the Versius Robotics Celebratory event. And I thank you all for sparing your valuable time to grace this event. We will begin our event flow without wasting your precious time. May I request our guests of honor, Professor Govindan Rangarajan, Director of Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru, and Padmashri TV Mohandas Pai, Chairman of Manipal Global Education, to come on the dais. I also invite our beloved Chairman, Dr. Venkatesh Krishnamurthy, and Managing Director, Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh, to join them on the dais. Thank you, sirs. We start the evening program with Dr. Venkatesh Krishnamurthy delivering the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of all the team members of the NU Hospitals, I welcome each and every one of you today for this celebratory event. Like the proverbial Arab and the camel, the robot has percolated several spheres of our activity. And it's a very telling comment that as a human being, now I have to declare that I'm not a robot to proceed with my activity on the computer. Other than the greeting and the welcome at the foyer itself, a separate formal welcome address always carries a special significance. It is our way of expressing our warmth and gratitude to all of you who have put in the effort to be present here for us today. We feel supported and motivated. This evening celebration marks our hospital extending its range of precision therapy in urology by way of the Versius robot. It is also a very special occasion on several different counts. Two of the finest minds that you have in the country grace the days today. Professor Dr. Govindan Rangarajan, the director of the IISC Bangalore, Padmashri Sri T. V. Mohandas Pai, the chairman of the Manipal Global Education Services and many other hats that he wears. Both are internationally recognized personalities in their own fields. Both are associated with the hospital sector of healthcare. Dr. Rangarajan recently and Sri Mohan Das Pai for a much longer period. We eagerly look forward to their perspectives on the healthcare scenario vis-a-vis -vis hospitals, standalone hospitals and their sync with research, clinical studies, training and so on. It is also special because we have in our midst our esteemed colleagues from the medical profession who have walked the path with us for over the past two decades. Our donors to the NU Trust who facilitate the extension of such services to the less affordable amongst us. And the opinion leaders from society who have spared time to be with us today. A warm welcome to all of you. It is significant that we have the presence of our partners from the health insurance sector. They play a pivotal role in opening up the services to the public at large. And they have chosen to spend time here today with us. Thank you very much and a very hearty welcome to you. We also have the big guns from CMR Surgical, representatives of the Versius robot in our country. Parth Khanolkar and Sri Rajesh, who are in charge of Asia, Middle East, and Africa, are here. A grateful thank you to you and warm welcome. 
And of course, I welcome the members of the various media who are here present here today. Their presence is important because they will be able to highlight the availability of such technology to the public at large. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. The dignitaries on the dais will now light the lamp and inaugurate this event. Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh, our Managing Director, will now address the gathering. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you present here today. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you and over the next five to seven minutes, I will speak very briefly on NU Hospitals. So NU Hospitals started in the year July 1999, and when it did start, it was the first single specialty hospital in the field of nephrology and urology of its kind in South India. We also hold the proud distinction of being India's first NABL and NABH accredited hospital. Most of the medical professionals associated in our hospital have been with us for the greater part of two decades. We currently have five branches, two branches in Bengaluru, Padmanabh Nagar and Rajaji Nagar. We have the National Eurorenal Fertility Center at Maldives. This is the first nephrology and urology center in the country of Maldives itself. And two years back, we also started our services at uh, Shimoga and at Ambur with KMNU Hospitals, which is a multi-speciality facility. Our strength comes from our team. And I'm proud to say that we are one of the few hospitals in the country that has got the Great Place to Work accreditation last year, especially in the year of the pandemic. And we also, thank you. And we've also got numerous awards where women empowerment is in the forte. A vast majority of our team members are women, greater than 55%. And 75% of the heads of department in our hospitals across all the branches are women. We have completed more than 600 kidney transplants, completed more than 45,000 urological surgeries, and another feather in the cap from the year 2016-17, 750 babies or more have been delivered through NU fertility. This is something where couples who are infertile and have complex genitourinary system problems, mainly male factor and female factor issues, and we have completed more than 325,000 dialysis. This is our bed strength and uh, with, if you total all of this, we are the largest private sector player for nephrology and urology in the country. So apart from the broad specialty of uh, nephrology, we cater to all the subspecialties of nephrology as listed there, which includes pediatric nephrology. 
and we have a very robust renal transplant program where we have both the diseased donor and living related transplants. We are also one of the few centers in the country that does pediatric kidney transplants and all donor surgeries are done by laparoscopic technique and now going forward it will eventually convert to the robotic technique. These are all the subspecialties of the broad specialty of urology that we have. We cater to pediatric urology, andrology, men's sexual health, uro-oncology, uro-gynecology, amongst all the other specialties. And that's NU fertility, which covers the entire gamut of the female fertility-related issues. We have a full-fledged reproductive medicine department that uh, takes care of this, ably supported by the andrology department, which, uh, for those who are not aware, 60% of the couple's infertility issues are due to male factor fertility problems. And this is something that uh, we are able to deliver our services for. We are also one of the few centers in the country that has the male sexual dysfunction and andrology department, which caters to the full gamut of services, including penile prosthesis. It's truly a proud moment to tell that all our hospitals are NABH and NABL accredited. This is the highest form of accreditation that the hospitals can receive, which is given by the Quality Council of India, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. The Rajajinagar facility was the youngest facility to achieve NABH accreditation within a period of 10 months of inception. Both the Ambur and Shimoga facilities have been accredited during the pandemic for NABH entry level and NABL entry level. And both our hospitals are also NABH nursing excellence accredited. Numerous awards have come our way. And this goes to show the excellent medical quality care that our doctors, senior medical team members, and non-medical team members actually provide. These awards are not only in the fields of nephrology and urology, but we have got awards for best HR practices, patient safety, etc., etc., at the national level being selected as the number one hospital. And in 2021, in the Times Health Critical Care Survey, we were ranked number one in Karnataka for the field of urology. These are some snippets of our hospital. This is at Rajaji Nagar. The operation theaters in all our hospitals have bioclad. Again, we were one of the first in the, we were the first in the country to install it as a cladding system. This is silver impregnated PVC sheets which prevent infection and adherence of uh, bacteria. So that's our uh, Shimoga facility and uh, that is our Ambur facility. Both of these are two years old. Can you believe that there is a kidney-shaped island amongst the 1,200 islands of Maldives? So we are there in Maldives since the year 2016. And uh, one of the forte that we as an organization took is to try and provide services where it's not available. Now that makes it much more difficult. It's much easier to start these services in large metro cities than to start them in tier two or tier three towns, or for that matter, in a country which is very small and which has never had many urology and nephrology procedures done. Our doctors did those procedures for the first time in the country of Maldives. We are also a center of postgraduate program and fellowship. We train DNB urology and nephrology students every year and we are proud to have them across the length and breadth of our country. Our country needs more and more super specialists. The number of doctors versus the population of our country, there is a huge discrepancy. And we are trying to do our part filling that gap. We are also one of the first in the country to start the renal dialysis program for both the bachelor's and the diploma. 
which is affiliated to the Rajiv Gandhi University and the paramedical board. Erstwhile, it was either the nurses or untrained technicians who were doing the dialysis. Now, of course, there are many more centers that offer this. Another feather in our cap, which I'm extremely proud to state, that our team publishes more than 15 to 18 articles in index journals in all these fields. And trust me, urology has the maximum number of rejections. Urology has the maximum number of journals amongst all specialities in medicine, simply because the amount of technological improvements that are happening in the field of urology is mind-boggling. We are trying to access the entire urinary tract through the place where we pass urine. That means there is miniaturization of equipment, miniaturization of scopes, more uh, opportunities for developing new procedures and more opportunities for research. We were the second hospital in the country to have our ethics committee NABH accredited. So whatever NABH has, we have covered all their accreditations. NU Trust is our corporate social responsibility wing. We take care of patients who cannot afford. Till date, we have not turned back any patient if they reach us for providing any care, as long as it is a reversible cause of kidney failure. The philanthropy space in urinary system disorders and renal failure is very, very low compared to other specialties, like, for example, oncology or ophthalmology or cardiology, for example. Uh, this is something where all of us need to do much more. And unfortunately, major urogenital system disorders affect the poorer socioeconomic status people. We also take care of our housekeeping and security children's education in all our units. So today's event is to welcome the future of medicine at NU hospitals, and we thank all of you for joining us today. We are entering a new era of healthcare. This is when robots and medicine come together, and we are proud to announce that we are the first nephrology, urology, and fertility hospital in the country to launch the CMR versus robot. Thank you very much for your patient listening and have a great evening. Thank you, sir. Now for the most awaited part of the event. I request our guests to unveil the Versius robotic surgical system.
That was truly phenomenal. Now I request Dr. Venkatesh Krishnamurti to introduce our guest of honor, Professor Govindan Rangarajan. Over to you, sir. It's a privilege to have the honor of presenting to the audience our distinguished guests of honor. Their names are a byword in our country for the pursuit of excellence and achievement. I always feel when you have somebody as well known as these people, it is an injustice to such extraordinary careers to sum up all that they have accomplished in just five minutes. But I guess they have learned to accept such mutilation to their work at every function that they honor by their presence. You may wonder why we introduce people who are already so well known. Introducing is actually the wrong word. We present them to the audience, to the public at large. Recounting their lives and reiterating their achievements serves as an inspiration to the public, to the audience, and motivates us to do much more. So this exercise of presenting the chief guest or the guest of honor serves a much larger purpose. I will try and fit in as much as possible. I will make a different kind of presentation. I have it on two slides. This is just a very short, very brief presentation of all that he has done. I will not interrupt you in your reading of this slide. He has taken over as director of the Indian Institute of Science in less than two years back. What is remarkable in the CV is that if you see, he received some of the highest honors both in the country and internationally at a very young age, more than 20 years ago. And that is what is truly creditable and not that he got something so long back. Professor Rangarajan is the first academician from the mathematics department in the Indian Institute of Science to become its director in its 115 year history. His demeanor is self-effacing. In fact, when he was posing for photographs against the backdrop of NU hospitals, I said he's always smiling like this. I have to learn that from him. His demeanor is self-effacing, always gracious, polite, and smiling, always. This appearance belies the tremendous scientific and administrative capabilities that he possesses. I have watched videos of his lectures, both to senior staff of the IIC and at the International Forum, and every single video of his shows that same smiling face when he is facing all those crowds. Within a short time of his becoming the director, he has carved trailblazing paths towards creative education and innovative research in all fields. Recently, the Indian Institute of Science, under his leadership, announced the setting up of an 800-bed multi-specialty hospital in their campus. So it is very appropriate that we have somebody like him as a guest of honor over here. This initiative has brought to fruition his vision of seamless coupling between the clinical sciences, engineering technology, basic sciences, and research, a first in the entire country. Such big steps in such a short time is unparalleled in the history of the Indian Institute of Science itself. His academic recognition and international honors sit very lightly on his shoulders. Sir, we are immensely pleased 
that you have chosen to, you have agreed to be here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Rangarajan. Thank you. Uh, it's an uh, honor being invited to this uh, unveiling. Uh, I think you are too kind in your introduction. <laughs> I don't think I deserve all the things that you said. Uh, one always just tries to do whatever one can in the limited time one has. Um, so first, let me congratulate uh, uh, NU Hospital on the launch of this Versius uh, robotic system. I'm sure this will be a game changer uh, in the city of Bangalore and probably in the whole country uh, in the field of uh, nephrology and urology. Uh, I think this is an appropriate time to reflect upon the role technology plays in healthcare. And that is one of the reasons why you know, we decided to start this um, postgraduate medical school. The 800 bit hospital is just a tool, an enabling tool for us to achieve this goal where we want engineering, science, and uh, medicine to come together. And uh, these days, it's uh, very important that you have all these disciplines coming together. For example, take the case of the mRNA vaccine, uh, so which has uh, probably protected almost maybe a billion people around the world uh, now. Uh, so. It's, uh, it was invented, it was, the basic technology was discovered at the UPenn Medical School. So again, it was a medical school which played the key role in, this, uh, in the discovery of the mRNA vaccine. And uh, what was needed to develop this vaccine was, of course, the basic biology to develop, develop the vaccine, and then also uh, nano-engineering uh, for the lipid coating of the vaccine, and the clinic clinicians, of course, to do the clinical trials. So right at in very recent times, during this pandemic, we have a prime example of how technology, science, and medicine need to come together if you need to make such advances. In India, uh, even though we have excellent um, standalone medical institutions, we have not had institutions, uh, you know, placed in a med medical uh, schools placed in a university setting which is this very common in the U.S., and that was something which we felt uh, was very missing here. And that was the reason, uh, you know, especially when I took over, the pandemic was raging, and so healthcare was right on top of my mind, and I thought this is the way one could make a difference uh, to the country. Uh, and it's not something which, uh, you know, uh, which was not thought of by the founders. Our, our founder, Jane Tata, was a visionary, and he wanted to start uh, medi uh, medical school right then, uh, about 112 years ago. And in fact, his son, Dorabji Tata, tried to uh, get uh, areas of medicine established. But then the first director, um, Professor Morris Travers, uh, nixed that idea. So it took 112 years then to <laughs> revisit that and come back to the vision of the founder. Uh, but I think the reason uh, I think is very important, and it's also important that uh, you know institutions like IAC collaborate with institutions like uh, NU hospitals, because in some sense we may have a long tradition in science and engineering, but we are newbies in the area of medicine. We have a lot to learn from hospitals like you, which have been very successful, which have been doing this for a long time. So I think it's very important that we have a healthy collaboration between uh, hospitals such as yours and us. And there are many areas where we can collaborate. And uh, only if we have such collaborations, we can have uh, such systems being developed in India and not having to import them. I think we should reach a stage where you know, we are able to develop such systems here. We are able to advance the whole field of uh, clinical science and research. And the one, we have a lot of strengths where we can help this. For example, the whole area of AI-enabled healthcare. Uh, that is a big buzzword these days. You have seen, you know, examples in the newspapers and so on where AI-enabled diagnosis routinely, you know, uh, is able to match the accuracy 
uh, which others do, uh, you know, which uh, practitioners in the field do. Uh, but there are also failures. For example, uh, you know, IBM Watson is a prime example of a failure where they tried to sort of automate uh, the diagnosis of cancer uh, and uh, that unfortunately failed. So it's not that one should uh, think that this is the cure for everything. I think uh, this is uh, just one tool which will be there in uh, the doctor's uh, tool chest that can be used uh, for better diagnosis. Uh, so, especially in the area of AI-enabled healthcare, this can really democratize uh, the uh, clinical care in the country, especially through telemedicine. That is something which has gained, gained prominence uh, in COVID during COVID time, and that is one area where AI can help a lot. Uh, in fact, we plan in IAC to go one step further, not just have the regular telemedicine, but also have telemedicine coupled with haptics and other advanced uh, technological uh, advances so that we can, the uh, doctor can not only see the patient, but also is able to, uh, you know, have the sense of touch Haptics refers to the sense of touch. So through uh, haptic devices, the doctors will also be able to touch the patient, see, you know, uh, which gives a better diagnosis, hopefully. Um, and the other big area, of course, is precision medicine. Uh, if you look at the disease, it's a whole continuum, and each individual is at some precise point in this continuum. And uh, no, probably, generic medicine will work perfectly in the same way uh, for all the people. Uh, so it's very important that we harness, uh, the, again, the uh, um, computer science skills, the genomic skills that we have. For example, India started this in India Genome Project, where we are going to sequence 100,000 genomes of uh, individuals in the country. So that is going to give the first uh, India-specific uh, genomic mapping of the country. We just didn't have anything like this. So uh, once we have this, uh, something which is specific to India, then we can hope to develop uh, precision medicine where you tailor the uh, cure to that person based on the genomic profile of the patient, of that patient. And now doing a genomic whole genome analysis is becoming cheaper by the day. Uh, so, therefore, I'm sure in a few years, it will be affordable to a large cross-section of the Indian population. Once you have affordable genomic sequences, then the logical next step is to ta precisely tailor uh, the, cure, uh, the treatment to that individual. And uh, these are some of the things which have been, uh, you know, uh, people have been doing for quite some time, but it's, again, the progress has not been as rapid as could have been expected. But we also need to look at futuristic areas. Uh, so, uh, for example, one such futuristic area is a body on a chip, uh, where uh, we would like to have organs, and then these organs are connected by microfluidics, so that you mimic the whole human system on a chip. The reason you would like to do this is then maybe the phase one trials of drugs need not can be offloaded to these chips. You can experiment with various drugs, see what happens, uh, you know, explore various what-if scenarios, and see what effect each drug has, what combinations of drugs, what effect they have on, um, on this chip before you start, uh, you know, a more phase two and phase three trials. So this is something very uh, futuristic. You also want maybe, you know, organ on a chip is something which you can start with and go to your human body on a chip. And ultimately, the goal is to have a digital twin, where you would have a uh, twin who's a digital copy of yourself as far as the functioning of the organs and so on are concerned. And again, that will take precision medicine or personalized medicine to the next level, where you can then, once you, if you have a very realistic uh, depiction of uh, an individual in a digital form, then again, you can do a lot of exploration on that digital twin rather than on the human patient and then see what works before going to the uh, patient. So these are things which will take time. I mean, these are very futuristic, but some of the futuristic technologies are uh, you know, coming to fruition. 
For example, in IAC, we are pursuing, and we hope to pursue this once the medical school starts, uh, nanorobotics, where you know we uh, place these uh, biocompatible robotic devices, and uh, then we are able to guide them through magnetic fields and or in general electromagnetic fields to go through the human body and then they can be loaded with the appropriate cargo and this is especially useful for oncology cancer treatment where then you have a precisely targeted uh, treatment of uh, the necessary areas by actually going using these nano robots and delivering uh, the drug to the precise spot that you want. So this is something which we have already demonstrated in the lab, that you can navigate these nanorobots through these tissues. Um, and you know, you'd have recalled uh, the movie you might have seen, Fantastic uh, Voyages, where you, know, you have na nanorobots going through the body. So that vision is coming to a reality now. Um, so once the medical school starts, we then can hope to start uh, clinical trials of these and where we can do this precise targeting of tumors through these uh, nanorobotics. And uh, other things we can do since you, I mean, one, I would like, one area I would like to mention, especially given that uh, you know, we are at uh, the launch for the new hospitals here, is artificial pancreas. That is something, again, you know, we have these glu continuous uh, glucose monitoring devices, uh, which have become quite, uh, you know, I wouldn't say commonplace, uh, but quite prevalent, uh, where you just wear a, a patch and that keeps on continuously monitoring your glucose uh, levels. That d definitely allows you to control uh, uh, the, uh, you know, insulin that is uh, given more precisely. But still, in engineering parlance, this is what is called the open loop control, you know, where you are just getting, uh, you are detecting it, but then uh, you are not getting a full feedback on what is happening. So what uh, one can do, and that is again something uh, which we are doing at IAC, is an artificial pancreas, where there is a closed loop system using AI ML uh, systems, where we can measure it, then through feedback loops, we can precisely tailor uh, the insulin doses so that the person does not have either hypoglycemia or uh, hyperglycemia. So again, this is something where technology plays a big role, uh, AI ML plays a big role, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So these are areas I'm sure, you know, in the artificial pancreas area we can collaborate uh, with uh, in new hospitals and uh, take this whole treatment to the next level. So, uh, and then you have the whole area of sensors. I talked about uh, glu continuous glucose monitors, but you have many other sensors which you can really develop and take them to the next level where you have continuous monitoring. For example, you already, have, this has become a reality. My Apple Watch can detect, you know, if I fall, you know, so it's especially useful for old patients. Then it'll automatically dial the emergency number I have stored in that watch so that the person immediately knows, uh, the relatives and others know when, when the person has had a fall. And it's progressing further, soon you'll be able to measure, you know, uh, blood pressure and all that. Already it measures SpO2 levels, uh, which was very useful <laughs> during the pandemic time, uh, needless to say. Uh, so the technology is advancing at a rapid pace. And I think it is uh, important that uh, hospitals which aim to be at the cutting edge, like uh, a new hospital, take advantage of these advances, collaborate with institutions on these advances, and jointly we can develop many uh, fantastic technologies for the benefit of uh, our country. And our goal should be very affordable technology. I think that is one of the missions of the IIC Medical School, that we want to develop affordable technologies. For example, again in COVID we have seen these monoclonal antibodies, you know, each thing costs 65,000. Uh, so in Indian population, most of them cannot afford these things. How do we develop affordable drugs? These are not going to be done by Pfizer and so on, you know, so they are catering more to the developed world. So what happens uh, to people in India and the developing world? It's organizations like us in collaboration that need to develop uh, such affordable uh, healthcare solutions. So with these words, let me stop. Thank you all for listening. Dr. Dilip Rangarajan, Group Medical Director and Senior Consultant Nephrologist and New Hospitals, 
will now felicitate our guest of honor, Professor Govindan Rangarajan. Dr. Venkatesh Krishnamurti will now introduce our guest of honor, Padma Shri TV Mohandas Pai. Over to you, sir. So that is a remarkable talk, an amazing opening up of vistas for what doctors can do in the future, other than outside, other than inside the walls of their hospital. I now have the pleasure of presenting Sri Mohandas Pai to the audience. I have a little anecdote here. Several of our medical colleagues, when we invited them, this is actually a busiest time for doctors in private practice, especially their clinics and the work. And when I mentioned that he was also one of the guests of honor, they canceled their clinic to come and listen to you. <laughs> Here too, I'm going to be brief in order that you get most of the information about all that he has done. Sri Mohandas Pai had always had fame and glory written into his future. He was a rank holder in his BCom, and when he got certified as a chartered accountant, there also he was an All India rank holder. He has been bestowed with the Karnataka Rajotsava Award and an honorary doctorate from the Rani Chennamma University, too. And these are not easy achievements. Both of them, I must say, that I seek your indulgence if I have left out more important parts of your achievements. In over 37 years of a very eventful working life, he has worked in a multitude of fields, finance, accounting, IT, HR, education, corporate governance, social impact innovation, philanthropy, environmental conservation, heritage preservation, and the list goes on. He is a metaphorical Ravana. He wears different caps at different times in the same span of 24 hours a day. A visit to his office is a pleasure. People who know him know that he is forthright and frank in his outlook and opinions, and it is a pleasure to listen to him. He has a huge collection of books in his office which he has gotten published. I had the good fortune to receive three of those. Two I have finished and I'm going through the third. Very interesting perspectives and an eye-opener for a cloistered medical professional like myself. I want to be invited to your office to receive more books. Despite all these great achievements in the national and international arena, basically to people who know him well, he is recognized as a socially conscious human being with a soft heart, which again defies his, defines his unique character. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Sri Mohandas Pai. Dr. Venkatesh, Dr. Prasanna, Professor Govindan, Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, my apologies for being late. I'm born in Bangalore, so my memories of Bangalore are pretty ancient. You know, we used to cycle to college, 
So we still think we can go across Bangalore in a short period of time. And I got stuck at the KSEA for whatever reason for 15 minutes. I want to thank you, Dr. Venkatesh, for inviting me. It's not often that doctors invite me like you did. The last time I addressed uh, a grouping of doctors in Delhi at their annual event on technology. Now, I'm very excited about technology because all of us are living in an era where technology is going to redefine the world and our lives. 250 years ago, a very event, eventful event took place in the world. That is the invention of the steam engine. And that changed the course of the world, which has been almost the same for more than two, three thousand years. Till then, India and China were the largest economies in the world because we had the largest quantum of skilled human power. So economies ran on human muscle and animal power. Then came the age of the machine, driven by venture capital, which came from trade by Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, and Europeans over 250, 300 years, where they traded with Asia and looted many countries, particularly South America, for the gold. And that led to a spurt of innovation and mechanization of industry, and that led to standardization, lower cost, colonization, and the growth of Europe. In 100 years, Europe became the greatest power the world has ever seen and they used the machine to dominate the world and become colonial powers. That led to the two great wars, 16 million people dead in the first industrial war, in the first world war, and 60 million people killed in the second world war, ending with the atomic bomb, which could destroy the whole of the human race. But the power technology gave to people was such, was enormous. And after that, we saw decolonization, and everything happened. And now in the last 20 years, we see another phenomenon take place, which is going to change the way that we live and the world politics for the next 25, 30 years, and that is the digital revolution. The industrial revolution created an industrial supply chain where a producer and consumer were connected together by a supply chain controlled by a few through transportation, through pipelines, through shipping, through retail, financial services, warehouses, etc. Because consumers and producers could not connect to each other globally. It was very difficult because you have to reach out to people. Now with the internet, a platform has come where all the people in the world can come together synchronously and asynchronously and communicate to each other 24 into 7. So we solved one of the biggest problems the world had ever since civilization began, how to connect all the people of the world. And all the people of the world can come together asynchronously, asynchronously, with using a mobile device and the cheap data plan. Now, out of 7.8 billion people on the planet, 5.5 billion people have a mobile device, 5 billion people are on the internet, and very soon the great majority, some more, are going to be in the internet. And once you come on the internet, it's a technology platform which connects everybody. All the world's accumulated knowledge is available on the web. On the web, you can get information and comments from the greatest experts the world has ever seen. The greatest professors. Lectures are there on the web, free of cost. You can do business on the web. You could be in a remote part of India or Africa, and you could do business with anybody anywhere in Sweden or Russia, or Japan, or whatever it is. And you could get payments from them, and you could get whatever you want. Just imagine the power of technology. It has broken barriers, it's leveled the field, just because we are on the same platform, all linked together. And this is going to accelerate. So business is going to be done there, medical help is going to be available there, knowledge is going to be available there, and we're going to get entertainment. And this became evident when the world shut down during COVID, where maybe 50% of the world transitioned to an era where you could get supplies to e-commerce, and you could get medical advice talking to doctors, and India changed the old silly rule where you could not do a video conference with the doctor instantaneously, and doctor's productivity went up. You could get medicine delivered at home, and you could get entertainment, and children got up in the morning, put on the uniform, went to the next room, opened the laptop, and they had school. And then the evening, they closed at 4, 4.30, and changed the uniform and went to play in the next room. And they had classes throughout the day. And it's almost seamless. Then you had entertainment. And older people, younger people, everybody, touch of a button, got entertainment. They could see what they want. They could see all the movies, visuals, everything else. And it's live. It just happened overnight. And 
You know, studies tell us that if for 45 days human beings change the habit, it changes forever. So our habits are changed forever. And that's the world we're going to enter. And that's the world which is going to be run by global monopolies. Apple has 2 billion people on iOS, on devices. And all the iOS people are together in an operating system which Apple controls with enormous amount of data. And Android has about 3 billion people, right? And all the data that's available. So what are we becoming? We're becoming pieces of data. What we eat, what we do, what we see, what we think, everything is available on the web to somebody who can assemble that and create a digital avatar of ourselves and that can control our mind. And that is the power that technology has given a few people and these digital monopolies which can go to other countries and work together are possibly the most dangerous threats the human race has today at this point of time. And we don't know how to manage them and how to manage the risk and every country is at risk because they become bigger than most countries imagine apple has an operating system of two billion people android has three billion people and the data that's being connected there you must have seen the movie the great hack where uh, you know cambridge analytica used the data that's available with facebook to send political messages to control the process of elections for people to win in the world. Now on social media, what is happening in some remote parts of the world is beamed to you with all kind of messaging using artificial intelligence to control our mind and make us behave in a particular way because most human beings are gullible. We listen to people. We believe that whatever we see as news is real. It's not real. These people have been controlling our minds ever since the newspaper industry and journalism started. And I saw an article where, you know, there's a conversation on TV, I think, between two people where a journalist said, hey, in social media, some people are trying to control the narrative. It's our job to control the narrative. We're journalists. How can they take over our job? So the biggest threat we have is this consolidation of power, digital power, and the biggest benefit we have is the digital power which links all of us together. And that's the world we're going to enter. And in the, that world, the cost of computing has come down because of cloud technology. I remember in um, 1994 when I joined Infosys, uh, we proudly negotiated the cost of a Pentium 4 machine and brought it down to $2,500 a machine. Pentium 4. We thought we are superheroes. Now you can get a, a, a capacity maybe 100 times, 1,000 times better at $500. And the computing power you, that you have in an Apple phone is far, far superior to a Cray supercomputer 10 years old, I think. Right? And it's happening. The power of computing is coming up. When the power of computing comes up, and that's going to oscillate because of quantum computing, but the speed of computing is going to go up 5x or 6x, and the power is available by lower cost of storage. That means the amount of data that is generated will be enormous. And using the data, you can simulate many things. You, can you simulate the birth of the universe? You can simulate it because we have the computing power. Earlier, if you want to simulate what happens when the Big Bang is supposed to happen in the first few seconds of the Big Bang, you, you have to simulate it. It requires a lot of complicated complications, uh, co computations. Now we can do it much faster because the computing power is cheap and the computing capability in terms of software is far higher and the data gathering is far higher. And that will have its repercussions on health, which I'm going to explain, Doc explain, and I'm going to add to uh, what he did. And then we have artificial intelligence, which are algorithms which use data and patterns to predict what is going to happen in the future with greater predictability. And using AI and computing power, you have this robo. We're going to have robotics, humanoids, where everything a human being does, maybe 60, 70 percent can be done by a machine. What is the beauty of this machine? The dexterity in those robotic arms. The robotics arm could not have the dexterity. Today, in Chinese factories, Apple iPhones are being assembled using robotic arms. Why is that? Because mathematical capability, predictive analysis, and computing power has gone so high that the dexterity has come. Please understand our fingers are so dexterous. We can do so many things with the finger. Look at the combinations that can go with these with this fingers. It's God-given, right? And when we do all this, how does it operate? 82 billion neurons in your mind is all stored and all these hands moving is already there as habit. It happens automatically by weak electrical impulses which go through the brain going through memory. 
When I stand here and I see your faces, I see Bhaskar, what do I see? I see an image. That image goes into my retina, it goes into my brain, my brain is stored his image, and it immediately recognizes him instantaneously, and I see what is happening. I can see faces, I can remember everything else. Because the memory capacity in the brain is so enormous, but it's all organic linked together. Right? So there is storage, there is analysis, there is connectivity, and all that can be simulated through an algorithm and computing technology. What is important is the speed of computing. That's why computing today has beaten the best players in chess, because chess is an algorithmic game. It's beaten the best players in Go, which is supposed to be a game where logic and analysis has to happen. And the best chess players now fight against the machine to become better and better. And all that has happened in a short period of time. And it's going to have an implication on our life. So we're going to have robots. Maybe robots will fight wars. What happened in Star Wars is going to be a reality. So we're going to have robots in conflict areas where robots will go and do all the resolution. They'll see through the cameras. They will understand. They will command. You have UAVs, unarmed, uh, unmanned vehicles which go, uh, all these uh, you know, drones which go somewhere and blast people. So you can see wars actually happening on your computer screen. Because you have satellite networks all around the world using technology which can see uh, and measure things up to 0.5 meters on the ground. It's fantastic. Through the clouds, you can imagine everything's happening. You can track very human being, and you can send out all these drones to do whatever you want and manipulate them. Why? That's the power of technology. And we are all going to become victims. Now, how is it going to improve healthcare? 17% of uh, America's GDP every year, I think, is spent on healthcare, right? And 15% of uh, the total health spend in America is spent in the last one year of a person's life when they make him a vegetable just to make more money out of it or whatever it is. I don't want to enter into argument, Doc. You know that much better. So enormous amount of spending is going to healthcare all around the world for diagnosis, for repair, and for curing people of illness, and people are living longer. The UN said that the world is going to have 11 billion people by 2100. Now they say it's 9.5 because fertility has come down all around the world along with advancement in women's education. And even in India, the whole of the South has got a fertility of 1.7. Replacement for India, I think, is 2.3, not 2.1. And we are going to see an aging India compared to what we think is an India with exploding population for various reasons. And that too is going to be impacted by technology. Today, 35% of Japanese young people do not have an interaction with the opposite gender. Now, we still can't produce a baby in a Petra dish. We still need human beings to work together to produce a baby, right? But human beings don't meet. What happens to city? What happens to countries? The Japanese population of 124 billion million people today will become 97 million by 2050 and, nine, and 67 million by 2100. Will India age and decline in population after 2050? Will China age and decline in population maybe 10 years from now? Because China peaked in you know, working age population about 10 years ago. So we are seeing a reduction in population growth. We are seeing an aging society come up. And we are seeing more and more technology. And we are seeing human beings mop into individualistic animals who are more self-contained and who interact with what is called the metaverse. The metaverse is a world where virtual reality and reality meet. And you want to see a metaverse, talk to a young person. A young person sees a screen. What happens the screen to simulation to games is something they relate to. And they go from reality to virtual reality almost instantaneously as if we are seeing a movie. And they live in that particular world. And in China, Korea, and in Japan, there are individuals who don't want to interact with human beings. They want to be interacting with technology because with human beings you have conflicts, you have arguments, but here you can do what you want and you can be self-contained and they become lonely. And that is going to impact people. So what are we going to do about it? Right? And that's the world that we're going to enter. All the things that we did together, living in human society, expressing affection, expressing desire, express, reading poetry, reading a thing, it's all going to change. And is it going to be a better world? I don't know. But the impact of technology is going to be built in medicine to robotics, what you see here. And now, the doctors should not read Grace Autonomy and remember those 5,000 pages or 4,000 pages or whatever you people do. You must learn to work here, look at all that, and that will prompt you what to do. And one day, the AI algorithm is going to replace the doctor itself, and the robot is going to sit here and do all the operations. 
But doctors are required because doctors give human beings who are older hope. When you're faced with something very dramatic, it's only the doctor who gives you hope and says, don't worry, you're going to be much better. The robot is still not there till you create a humanoid. And recently in China, they created a humanoid which interacts and which is, which is affectionate. And I heard in Japan, where 35% of the population, the body is 65, they're creating humanoids which are very warm, which talks to you, which are old, takes care of your loneliness, and you can hug them, and they're warm. So people have want a companionship through a machine rather than human beings because there are not enough human beings to give compassion. Now, what is the biggest asset a human being has? The biggest asset a human being has is not a bank balance, is not a qualification, is life. How do we live longer? Now, medicine tells us, I think if I'm right, you, you know it better, that after the age of 30, human cells regenerate at a lesser pace than they did up to 30, so the total quantum of human cells in the body keeps coming down, and as you age, you shrink in size, possibly become a mummy, or something like that, and you grow older, your size, everything comes down. You know, you get all this kind of stuff here, and all that, you know, we can see it in Bhaskar, even though it's slightly big right now. But... The important thing is, can you find out what is the trigger in your DNA that triggers off this event happening past the age of 30? And that's very evident in cricket, Doc. You see Sachin Tendulkar when he was 28, 30, he could strike a ball. I saw him play in Bangalore when Glenn McCarthy came and bowled. You know, a rifle shot, he went to the backwood and hit for a six. It's amazing, the reaction at that pace, right? Shoy Bhakter, Sevag used to put a bat out at 150 kilometers and turn it for a six to imagine the reaction, the eye, the hand, the leg, and the bat going and meeting the ball at a particular place when it's coming. Now, past 60 doesn't work. That's why when Rahul Dravid went to uh, Australia on his last tour, he got beaten between bat and ball four times and got bowled. And after he came back, he said, I'm not going to play anymore because my body is not reacting. The reactions are not there. So age is the biggest problem human beings have. So human race is aging, and human beings are living longer. Now, how do you extend your lifespan? That is the most important thing. All of you, most of you are very eminent people with a big bank balance, right? You're going to earn more and more. And robotics, you're going to be more productive and earn more money. What are you going to do with the money? Can you spend the money in innovation to make sure you live up to 120? Now, when you're young, the days never seem to the days never seem to end. When you're older, the day ends too soon. Because after 40, you've got less to look forward to than what you have been through till 40. Am I right? So as you grow older, you want to live longer and you want to be more healthy. Can technology elongate the lifespan so people can live healthy? Now this can possibly help. Stem cell research can help. 3D printing can help, where they can possibly 3D print your body organs, so you could get a body replacement all over the place. I don't know if everything else inside can be replaced. Doc will possibly know. That's why he set up the hospital, because he wants to make sure in his lifespan, uh, which is going to be pretty long, I'm sure that you can regenerate all the organs and put it inside so you can live up to 120. I think that's a fantastic investment all the donors are making, because I think they understand what you're trying to do. So can you live long? And if that happens... Imagine the money that will go into innovation. The world has more billionaires than any point of time in history. And what do billionaires want? One more year of life at 90. Not like Biden with the shaking hands all over the place, but, you know, fully with the mental faculties and doing something exciting with different kind of people, which Srini is now, you know, showing on his face what, he th what he's thinking, right? Because that's what people want. Are they willing to spend billions to elongate that? Yes. So more money is going into aging. Finding out the cost of aging. More money is going to technology research. More money is going into organ regeneration. More money will go into robotic surgery. More money will go into 3D printing to create body organs all over the place. In Bangalore, there's a company which is doing the 3D printing of blood vessels and the liver. I don't know whether they're successful, but they've been talking about it because young people don't know things can fail. Older people think it can fail. Young people don't know, so they recreate. We have a company uh, which is putting a mat with full of IoT devices, which Doc, you must have seen, which is taking all the five fundamental vitals of your body and putting it into an algorithm and to a database by which they can do a predictive analysis. And what they've seen is, for 1,000 people, they could predict two months later there's going, there's going to be a heart attack. 
And like Doc said, all this is going to create a digital avatar for you. So everything that you represent here, how your body flows, what your eyes see, what your organs are, and how your body cell regenerate is going to be in a digital avatar because all the data is going to be there. So if you fall sick, the medicine will be tested on digital avatar, and the avatar says, okay, it's going to come to you. Now, these are what is going to happen in technology. So I want to end by complimenting Doc for being a pioneer, all of you, in buying <coughs> these kind of machines. Of course, they're going to be extremely expensive, and the people who sell the machines are going to make an enormous amount of money. Hopefully, you'll make a little bit of money to pay for all that, and there'll be enough patience to pay for all that. But this is the future. But the benefit of this is the predictability and the precision that comes out of doing it repeatedly, driven by an algorithm. That's why uh, Dr. Uh, Govindan is extremely important, because the mathematician. As a mathematician, he can write an algorithm with precision, which makes this thing run, and do it better and better and better, and repeat. And this is not going to have, ask you for a salary raise. This is not going to tell you, give me a consultant fee more and more. The way to negotiate, negotiate the price down, and this can do the same thing again and again and again and again. All it requires is some electric power, which is very cheap, and this will work, and never ask. I hope one day in the IT industry, we create robots or algorithms, you can write code and everything else. So having, hired, having managed HR in my company, where I hired 200,000 people in five years and trained 250,000 people because 150,000 people left in those five years. I do know how difficult it is. And people, so you can algorithm, they're not going to come to you and ask you for a salary raise. No HR. They're going to work full time, 24 into 7. So they're going to be capitalists, they're going to be victims, and they're going to be machines in between, driven by innovation and mathematicians. So, Doc, I want to end and tell you this is going to be exciting. There's going to be good and bad. It's up to us as human beings to understand the good and the bad and to make sure the good dominates, for which we have to be everything. But the speed of change is going to be enormous. Innovation cycles have come down to 18 months from 36 months, and the speed of change is enormous. India is possibly three to four years behind, but I think the change that's going to happen, how is going to happen? That mRNA medicine that happened, right, for the vaccine. That's a recombinant DNA, am I right? How the DNA can be manipulated. So you can get medicine based on your DNA analysis when you have all the genomics things done. And that is going to be the future. So doctors have to understand technology, go beyond uh, grace autonomy, because all that is there in grace autonomy can be put into your chip, into your head, so you can recall it instantaneously and that will connect to the neurons, so you don't have to read grace autonomy anymore, and that will be a fantastic day. So thank you very much, and wish you all the best. Dr. T. Krishna Prasad, Senior Consultant Urologist and Robotic Surgeon in New Hospitals, will now felicitate our guest of honor, Padma Shri TV Mohandas Pai. Dr. T. Krishna Prasad will now provide us valuable insight into robotic surgeries. A warm welcome once again to everyone here and uh, specifically to the two dignitaries and the guests of honor on the stage for having taken time out to come and be with Team NU at this uh, important milestone in our, uh, in our healthcare services which we provide to our patients where we have started incorporating robotics into the clinical care pathways. And after the visionary talk by Shri Mohandas and the very practical talk by Dr. Govindan, um, I'm going to go even lower than that, so bear with me a bit, uh, trying to explain to you the uh, bare bone basics of what stands behind me. So if I were to speak the word of robot, then is this what conjures up in your brain? Um, these are some of the most popular robots in the last five decades. But as you can see, they, they bear no resemblance to what stands behind me. We're quite away from here with the help of visionaries like Dr. Mohandas and uh, Dr. Govindan. Probably we will reach there far quicker. It's a machine capable of carrying out complex series of actions automatically 
and possibly programmable by a computer. So let me pause here and uh, assure all of you that in the view and in the view of patient safety, current systems and current generations of surgical robots cannot perform anything automatically. There is a significant move worldwide away from any autonomous movements. Are they programmable? Yes, but usually within a template. And even those surgical instruments have to be handheld by the surgeon and moved within the template. You cannot move it out of the template. So rest assured that these devices are safe. And there are very few of them. Just 16,000 medical robots, 0.04% or 0.004% of all the robots which are installed worldwide, about 3.7 million of them. And if you drill down further, they're even lesser. So what you see behind me is a surgical robot. What Dr. Mohanda spoke about were telepresence robots, rehabilitation robots, which keep you warm, which interact with you, or which allow surgeons to interact through them to patients which are present, who are present elsewhere. So if you look at it, the number of surgical robots are even lesser, just about 10,000. If you take away the tethered robots I spoke about, which are just orthopedic robots cutting out a template in bone, truly remarkable devices which can perform complex surgeries like the one behind me, they probably are only 8,000 in the world, eight or 9,000. And if you look at India, where do we stand? I'll give or take a few numbers on this slide. If you look at 77 robots for every uh, 138 crore population of India, you're having one surgical robot for 18 million Indian population. That's a very, very small, minuscule number. And why is this so? If technology could be made so quickly, it's just a matter of few things put together and a bit of software written together, then why is it that we can't adopt it or why are they so few numbers? It's been approved 22 years ago and a majority of surgeons like me, urologists, are the ones who have been using these robots across the world. But yet, we use it only about 17 to 7% 7 of our surgeries. Why is this so? And the answer is in this image. They are large, they are unwieldy, they are heavy, they can't be moved around, you can't break them into pieces. They're not modular. You can't take one arm off this device and say, okay, I just want to work with three. I can't work with two or I don't want to work with four. They're not very easy to set up. And because of the costs involved in making them and like what Mohandas told us, that the, they're extremely expensive. That's where possibly CMR has cracked the code. Let's welcome the guest of today's evening. CMR versus robot once more. is now at any hospitals. So what is it that made this different from the current existing technology and where um, was, uh, CMR has cracked the code is in the size, in miniaturization. So this basic unit which you see here is what they have called as the bedside unit. It is extremely small, it has a very small footprint by virtue of having the entire robotic arm mounted on a central pillar which has all the activating motors in it. And it's extremely portable. My senior theater nurse can move this around by herself. Believe me, the other competing system is about 550 kgs. I don't think she'll be able to push it by herself. 
you can use these as modular units. You can configure them in any configuration that you want. Here is a system where you have two of them on one side of the operating table and another arm placed on the opposite side. Or you can have it configured all on the same side of the table depending on what surgery you're performing. It obviously has a wide range of instruments which you can use to perform the necessary surgeries. But what is important is the way these arms can be moved out of your operating field. As a surgeon, I want access to my patient at all times. I do not want a big object, even if it is a robot taking care of the surgeries and even if I'm driving it to stand in the way of me and my patient. So that's where uh, the CMR robot has completely changed the game. As you can see, it can, the arms can be moved out of the uh, field of the interest and with the three joints the shoulder the wrist and the elbow it pretty much behaves like the human hand The other part of any robotic system is the console. Most systems which are currently in operation are what we have, uh, what have, uh, what they have is a, a closed console system. The, the head of the surgeon sits inside a viewing box. You're no way connected to the rest of the operating room. You literally have to get up and turn your head around to see what's happening to your patient, what exactly are the robotic arms doing. Uh, move away from such kind of closed consoles is the open console concept where you can see the screen. I can just tilt my head around, see what's happening to the patient and also see what the robotic arms are doing at the same time. And wonderfully, this console has the ability to even stand and operate if you're, I mean, as surgeons, I would have been standing and operating for the better part of our lives. Uh, this allows us to sit, but occasionally I would definitely like to be standing up if I can especially the surgeries are for longer duration. With the controllers, uh, which are pretty much like what we have used when we were little children, allow us to access all the functions of the, and all the joints of the uh, robot and perform all the precise tasks. So if you look at this, the little lever which is holding the index finger allows us to open and close the jaws. The joystick allows you to control the camera. The oblong oval shaped uh, button can stop or start the instruments and the round button there allows us to use energy sources to either cut or seal tissue wherever appropriate. So it's definitely not a threatening system as you can see it's definitely smaller than me. So why would we argue for robotic surgery? If I'm a lab surgeon for the last 15 years I can pretty much do most of these surgeries laparoscope. First three are pretty much common. Smaller incisions, less pain, more magnification is common to both systems. But what is important for you to understand is the access to deeper areas, like the lower part of your abdomen, and more importantly, the precision with which we can perform some surgeries. With the straight instruments you have in laparoscopy, it's difficult to make the curving movements which our wrist makes. That's, that's extremely tough to achieve. And that's where the robot changes the whole game. And that's how the arms, uh, when they're positioned in the theater, look like. The patient is there. You can't see on the far end is my console, where I operate from. And this is an extremely small snippet uh, about the uh, we surgery which we performed. Uh, we're trying to remove a small tumor from the patient's kidney. Uh, we are trying to first isolate the blood vessel, which supplies the blood to the kidney. Occasionally, we need to clamp this. Uh, you can see the dexterity with which the hook can move around the vessel. That's the tumor. About 70% of it is inside the kidney. The robot allows us to dissect more precisely through the parenchyma of the kidney, and that's the you know, defect which is left behind. Look at the ease with which you can suture. The way the, 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 uh, the needle holder is able to turn, especially on its wrist, uh, is not something which I can do with a straight instrument. It's, it's extremely tough to do that. You need years of practice to, to get that movement using straight instruments. You don't need that much of a time with robotic uh, 
uh, with the robot in situ there. So that's how it looks when we finish. Uh, I'm happy to say that we have done a few world's first surgeries. Uh, Dr. Prasanna has done the world's first uh, pediatric pyeloplasty. Um, I have done two uh, nephrectomies, one of which was uh, the video I showed you about. But what is important is I can't do it without a team. That is my team which allows me to function optimally using the robotic system behind and create world-class surgeries. And what who are not seen here are the technicians sitting right up there behind. I thank the CMR team for their immense support and patience through uh, all the surgeries that we do. Uh, managing a system which is so complex is not just um, uh, an easy task. I, I'm only a driver in the seat. Uh, to manage this machine, you need huge amount of uh, technical knowledge, and, and, and I really thank the team uh, uh, for uh, you know helping me uh, do these uh, surgeries. So. Uh, we have done a modest number of surgeries. These are just to name a few. Uh, and you can already see that there are three of them which are listed as world's first using this robotic system. And that is the challenge. Uh, when when, you, when uh, industry brings technology to us as surgeons, uh, we learn and we need to understand how to ad adopt it to the day-to-day -day needs of a, of a patient. It's not that easy. I mean, even these three world's first surgeries required a lot of planning and tremendous amount of help from my team as well as the support team to perform these. So it looks beautiful on the slide as having done the world's first X, Y, Z using this system, but it takes a lot of effort for us to get to this point. Uh, I thank you for your patient understanding and listening to this uh, little lecture. I'm happy if you can stay around and see how this system can function uh, when a surgeon actually uses it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, Dr. Dilip will deliver the oath of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, we would like to thank our guests of honor, Sri Professor Govindan Rangarajan and Padma Sri Sri Mohandas Pai, for having graced the occasion and also enlightened us with their wonderful talk. This is amidst their busy schedule. Our thanks to CMR surgical team, comprising of Mr. Rajesh, Mr. Partha Kanulkar, and the entire team for having provided this, this system as well as gracing the occasion. Thanks to all the invitees who are here, comprising of medical as well as non-medical personnel. A lot of them are referral doctors, our friends, our donors, and well-wishers. I thank them all for their wholehearted participation in this function. Our thanks goes to the members of press and media who have come to cover this event. Special thanks to Media Connect, Divya and their team for their coordination. We also thank the personnel from insurance companies and TPS, Dr. Venkatesh was mentioning, without whom it's very difficult to function. Our thanks to JW Marriott for providing a wonderful venue for this event. The management of NU also places its appreciation for all the staff of NU for having put in their efforts to enable this event. Thank you and a very good evening. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the national anthem.
जय हे जय 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 हे थैंक यू एवरीवन our chairman and managing director will now proceed for the press briefing session thank you ladies and gentlemen dr krishna prasad will now give us a demonstration of the robotic system invitees may please join the demo will also be cast across all the screens in the ballroom area dinner is served cocktail counters are open please enjoy yourselves have a great evening thank you <laughs>